Hey guys, welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. Today's video is a little bit different, but I'm going to give you guys an inside look into the passage that my students are covering in class this week. This is the passage that they selected. It is a 1924 court case, and we're going to be looking at the closing argument. So what I've done here is I've created a prompt based on that passage, and I'm going to show you guys how I would break down that prompt. We're going to look at the passage chronologically, and I'm also going to show you guys how to include some commentary about the rhetorical situation. So there are going to be a few times when you can actually practice with me during this video. So if you want to go ahead and pause your screen at those times, it's absolutely fine. If you don't want that practice and you want to just keep playing the video, it's absolutely fine as well. So here is the actual prompt. It's a little bit long because there are lots of details in here, but if you want to practice breaking down a prompt, go ahead and pause the video and look for the speaker, occasion, audience, and purpose. So based on the prompt, we know that the speaker is Clarence Darrow, who is an American lawyer, and he was opposed to capital punishment, which means that he was opposed to the death penalty. So that gives us a sense of what he values. The audience is going to be Judge John R. Caverly. And if you're wondering why the audience is not a jury, I was actually wondering the same thing, so I looked it up. And the reason is that Clarence Darrow had his clients plead guilty. They were actually going to plead not guilty at first, and they wanted to go for insane insanity, but apparently there was some kind of rule that they could be tried twice for insanity and he didn't think he could win two separate cases. So he wanted them to plead guilty and then he tried to go for a lesser sentence. So when you plead guilty, it's not a trial, it's a hearing. And I'm going to try very hard to say hearing and not trial throughout this whole video. So when you have a hearing, you go in front of a judge and not a jury. Therefore, since this is a hearing, the audience is just a judge and not a jury. Now that we've gotten that mini legal lesson out of the way, let's talk about the occasion. So the occasion is essentially, in my opinion, the combination of context and exigence. So if you prefer those terms, it's absolutely fine. I usually prefer occasion, to be honest. So for this, we need to know that it is the closing arguments, which means that it's the end of the court case. They're wrapping everything up. We need to know that it is a hearing, which we already went over what the difference between a hearing and a trial is. It's 1924, so the year is significant. We know that that is post-World War I, and we know that they're being charged with kidnapping and murder. They killed a 14-year-old boy. And also, this is taking place in Chicago. Now, as far as purpose, we're told that he wanted to have a lesser sentence, and so he was opposed to the death penalty, so he's trying to not only get his clients a lesser sentence, but this is like a personal battle for him because he's so vehemently opposed to it, and we know that he actually was successful with this because it said so in the prompt. So in some sense, we can infer that he must have been rather convincing. So right now, we're going to look at the first paragraph of the passage. If you want to take a second to analyze this on your own, then go ahead and pause the screen and make sure you look for what Clarence Darrow is doing and why he's doing it. So ask yourself, what choices is he making and why are these choices appropriate for his audience on this occasion? If you don't want to analyze it yourself, just let the video play all the way through. This slide shows the first paragraph of the excerpt. So one thing I didn't point out earlier, but I want to call your attention to is the fact that this passage is not his entire closing arguments. It's only a portion of it. So an excerpt is basically a portion of a larger text. It's not the entire thing. In fact, apparently, Clarence Darrow's closing arguments for this case lasted 12 hours. So this is the start of the excerpt that we're looking at. The words that are bolded are words that I felt were significant. And the questions at the bottom are questions that I think students should be able to answer. They're just little comprehension questions. So why does he directly address the judge? What major claim does he make? That's important. You need to figure out what his main point is because you need to start to figure out what his argument is. What, according to Darrow, are the causes of the murder and why is this important? Now, keep in mind that his clients have already pled guilty. So if he's suggesting that there are other causes, there's a reason for this. And that's absolutely crucial to his defense. So we want to make sure that we understand what he's saying here. And then lastly, there were a couple of words that I felt were significant. The first is conspired. So what is the significance of that word? What is its connotation, perhaps? And then also he refers to them as two poor boys. So what is the significance? 
significance of the word poor there and then also the word boys because remember they're 18 and 19 years old so they're legally adults but he's referring to them as boys so why does that matter so this slide shows you guys a sample paragraph that I wrote and what I did here is I bolded certain verbs to show you guys the importance of using strong rhetorically accurate verbs in your analysis and so some of these verbs suggest a choice whereas others tend to lead to commentary so for instance when it says by reminding the judge that's telling us what he's doing whereas when it says that he implies that's starting to analyze what's actually happening so if you guys want to take a second to pause the screen and read this you're welcome to but I want to draw your attention to a couple of the verbs that I think are more important here I use the phrase subtly implores so implores is a good verb to suggest call to action so if you're not familiar with that verb I would take a second to look it up and try to use it in context because I think that is a verb that students should know how to use. Also shifting the blame here. So if you want to look for tone shifts or shifts in subject, that could be a good thing to note in a paragraph as well, because it shows that you're understanding the different movements of the piece. And then we have other verbs like portrays and further emphasizes, which can work in a variety of ways as well. So I tried to vary my word choice in this paragraph. Some of the verbs are redundant, and if I were revising this, I would probably go back and fix them, but I wanted you guys to see that verb choice can help the quality of your writing. A lot of students ask how they can earn the sophistication point, and it's not just one singular thing. Using stronger words is not automatically gonna earn you that sophistication point, but one of the things that you can do in general to try to be a better writer is to work on your word choice and I think students should start with verbs. Don't worry about using these big words that you might not use in everyday conversation. Work on your verb choice first. Now I'm going to show you guys the same exact paragraph except this time I've color coded it for the rhetorical situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for relationships between these elements here. And honestly guys the idea is to include as much of this as you can in your analysis but you're going to see that I included only five of the six and I'm going to tell you why. If you guys look at this paragraph, you'll notice that I use five of the six colors. I didn't actually color code the speaker, but I did reference him several times. The reason why is because I didn't actually analyze anything about him. I just referenced the choices that he was making. And so for me, if I want to actually color code that, I would need to talk about his credibility or maybe his values. And I didn't actually do that in this paragraph. So I didn't color code his name any of the times that I used it. But what I do see here is that I reference the context quite a bit toward the top and I have referenced his argument which is important and I have analyzed his relationship to the audience. So I'm satisfied with this paragraph and I think this color coding exercise can be helpful for students. One thing that I would do especially if you're writing a full essay is look at your color coding not just within a paragraph but throughout the entire essay as well because for instance here I didn't really analyze the speaker but if that trend continued throughout the essay that might be something that I would want to address upon revision. Okay, so now we're going to look at the second paragraph, and if you want to look at it yourself and take some notes before you hear my thoughts, you're welcome to pause. As with the previous paragraph, I bolded what I felt was important. So as with the previous paragraph, some of these verbs are meant to indicate a choice that he's making, such as asking, he asked that question in the beginning, and also you'll see that I use parallels. So he used parallel structure there, or you could say parallelism. And so using the verb indicates a choice, and sometimes that sounds more natural in your writing. So even if you know the name of the choice, like juxtaposition, sometimes saying he juxtaposes sounds more natural, so it's okay to use the verb form. Other verbs here indicate commentary. I use the same color coding strategy for this paragraph, but you're going to notice that it doesn't quite have the same amount of color coding as the previous example. But one of the reasons that I'm color coding the rhetorical situation is to make sure that I have even commentary throughout the paragraph. So even though there's less commentary here, it's still present throughout the paragraph. I'm not color coding the evidence, but it is important to have evidence in your paragraph. You can either have a direct quotation or a paraphrase. Both of those things count as evidence. And you want to have commentary that explains the significance of that evidence to create layers throughout the paragraph. 
So this is the third paragraph of the passage. And previously I've shown you guys one paragraph of the passage and one paragraph that I've written, but that's not realistic for an entire essay because number one, you've got about 40 minutes and number two, you're not going to be doing a one to one ratio the entire time. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys multiple paragraphs and what I found important. And then I'm going to show you how I would combine that in order to write a more effective paragraph later on. So here is paragraph three and the bolded words are what I thought would be important. You'll notice that Clarence Darrow is talking about mercy here. So anytime you guys see sort of like an abstract concept like justice or mercy, that's going to be important. You want to really figure out what the speaker is saying about those concepts. So this is the fourth paragraph and you'll notice that he actually includes a stanza of poetry here. So if you have this outside source, you need to ask yourself, okay, wait a minute, why is he actually citing a stanza of poetry here? So I went through and I bolded certain words because I needed to figure out how this stanza of poetry related to his overall message. So these paragraphs are shorter, but you'll notice that he actually referenced the night, which was part of the previous paragraph in that poem. So I bolded that because there was a connection there. And now he's starting to shift a little bit. He's actually shifting his focus to the families of his clients. And so if you notice a shift in either tone or topic, it's going to be important to note that as well. And so he's actually changing the focus here. And we want to ask ourselves, why is he doing that? So why is he putting the focus on his clients' families and not his clients? So you'll notice that he's still asking questions as a major choice, and he's still focusing on his clients' families, not just the current family, but also the future generations. And so he's very concerned with their reputations and the cost on the family, not necessarily his clients themselves. So when you analyze a passage chronologically, you're going to be dividing the passage up into sections, usually three, sometimes four sections. And the idea is that you're going to be looking for major movements within that section. And that section is probably going to include multiple paragraphs. So the paragraph that I wrote here references what you just saw on your screen. So as with the previous examples, I've bolded verbs that I felt were important. So we've got to garner, shifts, established, emphasizes, evoking, furthers his argument. And so you can see here that some of these verbs pertain to the purpose. Some of these verbs pertain to a choice that he's making. But the idea is to try to be as precise as possible with the verb choice in order to create more specific commentary. So you can see here that as with the previous examples, I've color coded it for the rhetorical situation and it seems to be done a bit more evenly throughout and we actually have a reference to the speaker this time. So I want to call your attention to the topic sentence because this one actually references the purpose and then later on in the paragraph we have a reference to his argument. And one tip I have for students is to make sure that when you use the phrase his argument or his message that you actually specify what the argument or message is. And you're going to be doing this multiple times throughout the essay perhaps so you want to try to vary your word choice as you do so. That can be a little bit tricky but it's better to say what the message actually is as opposed to just saying the message because if you just say the message it doesn't actually indicate to your reader that you know what the passage is talking about. You can see that we have multiple references to the audience and a few references to the exigence. Let's talk about conclusion paragraphs because I know some students find those a bit tricky and quite honestly, one of the reasons that they're tricky is students feel like they've already said everything they need to say or they feel like they've run out of time. So one trick for conclusions is to actually analyze the rhetorical situation even more. Now, some of this is stuff I've already said in those previous sample paragraphs that I showed you, but I want to show you guys this example of a conclusion. And I'll admit it's not perfect, but the first thing I tried to do was remind my reader of the exigence. So you want to prove that you understand the rhetorical situation here. So we have the fact that it's closing arguments at a hearing, and I referenced the client's last names just to show that specificity here. The next thing I did is I started to analyze the speaker because I didn't really do that in those sample paragraphs. And so if you find that you underanalyze something in your body paragraphs or perhaps you miss something and you have an idea and you haven't yet included it, it is okay to bring up new analysis in your conclusion if you need to, as long as it's still relevant. So here I started talking about his prowess as a lawyer and also how it highlights his staunch opposition to capital punishment. This shows his honesty about his beliefs, but it also shows that he's not disillusioned. 
So for the rest of the paragraph, I mentioned things that I had already talked about in my essay, but I tried to make sure that I referenced the major points I was trying to make, specifically the impact on the audience and also the major points of Clarence Darrow's argument. Because Clarence Darrow had multiple movements in his argument, so I wanted to make sure that I addressed all of those in my conclusion as well, because they all work together to form this really strong closing argument. And then at the end here, I talked about how it was convincing because we do know from the prompt that the judge did rule in favor of the lesser sentence. So whatever Clarence Darrow did, it had to work. If you guys found this interesting and would like additional access to either the prompt and passage or to these sample paragraphs, I will leave links to them in the description box below. And also, if you're trying to improve your rhetorical analysis essays, try that strategy where you bold the verbs or you color code based on the rhetorical situation because I think it might actually help you guys. So until next time, guys, happy writing.